I want you to take a look at a particular picture. It's one of the iconic images of the late 20th century, and it seems to belong to a more innocent age, the young and pretty preschool teacher Diana Spencer, who had just then found her prince. Now, as it happens, it was taken by an Irishman who has since become famous for even more iconic images. I want you to welcome, please, Mr. John Minahan. Hello, John. You're very welcome. Thank you very much for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let, let's talk about that front page Diana picture, because that was the first posed press picture of Diana. That's right. Um, it was in the summer of 1980. Um, I, I, I was in the office about half past six in the morning, and just off the conference, the pic then picture editor um, dispatched me down to a kindergarten, because there'd been a story in the Daily Mail. Nigel, Nigel Dempster was the diarist of the Daily Mail. And the story s simply said that, uh, uh, Diana Spencer was now the new love in Prince Charles's life. He had, in fact, relinquished his relationship with her sister Sarah for uh, maybe other reasons where the media might have, you know, gone to town. Yeah. But anyway, I was dispatched down to a kindergarten in Pimlico where this young Diana Spencer was working. And I was the first photographer there. And when I knocked the door, uh, it's almost like she expected me. And what she did, in fact, expect me. And she wanted to know what, I, what, what I'd like to do. And I said, I'd like to photograph with some of the children. And of course, she had to get permission from the parents of the... In fact, there was two little girls in the photograph. I mean, even now, of course, with the sort of photography, I had photographed Diana holding up two little girls. But we airbrushed one of the little girls out of the picture, <laughs> just because... Uh, just to fit the frame. It, just to fit the frame, because tabloid newspaper. But that was the first picture. And of course, she had absolutely no idea what I was looking at in my viewfinder. But I just knew when the light was hitting her legs that this was something stunning. And, of course, we were the first paper in the world to put that picture on the front page. And that led to a, a storm. I mean, the next day, she was pursued by all your colleagues and more. Well, not, not, not necessarily the next day. I mean, by the time she got back home where she was living in Earl's Court, that photograph was on the, the front page. And, of course, her flatmates had seen the photo photograph. So it wasn't just a salacious picture of a very sexy young teenager. It was, but it was a bubbly, interesting, fun picture, and she liked it. And I gather that uh, Prince Charles had said he didn't realize, in fact, she had such Great Lakes. All right. <laughs> anyway, that was the beginning, if you yeah. like, of her um, very turbulent relationship with photographers and paparazzi, which culminated in the way she, she lost her life. But by that stage, you had moved on to other pastures, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, you had other great front page stories. Tell me about Mark Thatcher and you. Well, uh, well, I have little to do with Mark Thatcher particularly, but I was actually sent over to uh, Algeria because Mark Thatcher went on a safari with, a, with a, his co-driver was a French lady. And for some reason, in fact, Mr. Thatcher got lost in the <laughs> Sahara. And, uh, of course, it was all kinds of kerfuffles. Maggie was in tears. And uh, anyway, I was dispatched over to a little place called Taman Rasset, which is maybe, I don't know, about 100 miles from Timbuktu. And for about a week, I was there. And like anything in journalism, I mean, you know, particularly for photography, I mean, today it's inconceivable for photographers to you know, with the digital age, you know, you can just take a photograph and with satellite, would take, you can send it from where you are. But I made friends with some of the local sort of Bedouin sort of people there. And I said, look, I must get this photograph. If you hear Mr. Thatcher, because I was wearing my Levi's jeans and they wanted this gear. So I said, you look after me and I'll give you all my clothes. <laughs> and actually, what actually happened about three o'clock in the morning, I was in a bar. And when I say a bar, it was a, so it was a shed with no roof on it, drinking Algerian wine. And, and this man came, Mr. John, Mr. John, we found Mr. Thatcher, Mr. Thatcher. And sure enough, I was dispatched to an airport, and Mark Thatcher came in. By that stage, his father had come over from London and uh, was there. But you can imagine, he had a, a, a sort of growth of beard there. His co-driver, the French lady, was absolutely relieved that she was rescued, I, I think more away from Mr. Thatcher than anything else. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that was 3 o'clock in the morning. But then I had to sort of get to Algeria. I had to get back. And you I had said to physically to my, fly the had picture to back. fly, get on the plane. But there was one plane going out in the morning, but my friends, I was standing at the airport and they were dragging out people from the plane so that I could get on the plane and get into Algeria to actually process the film and then get the film back to the London Evening Standard. Yeah, different world now, as you say, That's right. three minutes the, the picture can actually be, be mm. uh, formatted for the front page and you could be anywhere in the world sure. pretty, pretty, pretty much. Um, one of the things that kind of changed the impression of, of what you did was a series of photographs, the wake of Katie Tyrrell. Now, tell me about this sequence and how it came about. 
Well, it's, and in fact, it's, it's, it's the, the wake of Katie Tyrrell, first of all, I've been photographing my hometown since 1962. I mean, I was an Irish photographer in London. So, I mean, I always felt Irish, and I was continually c coming back to Ireland. And about 1963, <clears throat> a cousin of mine was getting married, and he couldn't afford to have a photographer, basically. And I, was there, I said, well, I'll do the photographs. So, th for me, that was the beginning of my photo essay in a thigh. It was really important because, as an apprentice in the, on the Daily Mail, I had access to magazines. I used to look at Life magazine and Picture Post, so I saw how story development actually happened. So I, I had the advantage of seeing. And so I, I stole some of that imagery, some of the way, you know, the design, the draftsmanship of taking pictures. And I just used that in a thigh to, to put together this photo essay. But the, the, the sequence on Mrs. Tyrrell happened in February 1977, and it was, and it is today still to me, it was, it's the whole heartbeat by which my whole photographic um, essence is built around. You know, yeah. the wake of Katie Tyrrell over two nights and three days. This is Katie Tyrrell, and... I mean, to me, she looks like an elderly Indian squaw. That's what she looks like. Except that the Irish uh, clues, if you like, BVM, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mm. I'm not sure what kind of an outfit she's wearing. She, well, she's wearing the Legion of Mary burial shroud. You know, blue is a color associated with the Madonna. And Mrs. Tyrrell mm. obviously uh, belongs to the Legion of Mary. And um, I mean, immediately when I, when I, I mean, I had to get permission and I was given permission, but it's almost like I had to be there to record this sequence of events because uh, it, it is today the most stark sequence of photographs I've ever taken and they're really important to me because in a world that, which is escalating so fast you know we're not supposed to die anymore yeah. but it, uh, it, that's one of the nice qualities about Irishism which I like the fact that irris irrespective of how impoverished we were at a time of bereavement people would come in and help and, each and other. By giving her a name too, I mean there are many photo essays you see where the people are nameless, yeah. um, you, you actually make sure to dignify your subjects with, with their own names. I mean there's a Mary Byrne uh, photograph. Sure. Tell yeah. me about Mary Byrne. Well Mary actually, Mary had known me during the years this, going this back Mary now. on my soirees back to a thigh and one day she saw me with the cameras and um, cause by that stage, she'd seen some of the photographs being published in photographic magazines. There was about 12 photographic magazines being published in the UK. And Mary said to me one day, she did not always look like that. So she proceeded to go into the, uh, to her little cottage and brought out that photograph, telling me that she, she used to work as a sort of uh, chambermaid in a lion's corner house. And this was a photograph within a photograph, but it had a little narrative. So yeah, saying, was I wasn't Mary always Bond. this old this lady. Right. Yeah. There is a young woman in yeah. there. But also she's happy there. She doesn't, she's not looking you know, as a voyeur, but she's happy to be part of this, this mm. uh, essay. Uh, it was this kind of work, and the Katie Tyrrell uh, sequence particularly, that uh, enabled you to actually make real contact with Samuel Beckett. Well, that's right. I mean, uh, I didn't realize at the time, but Samuel Beckett had arrived in London from his home in Paris, and a friend of mine, an Irishman living in Notting Hill Gate, told me that uh, uh, Mr. Becker was in the Hyde Park Hotel. And I was actually amazed and I was delighted because I had been trying to track him down for 10 years. So I wrote him a note to say that I was an Irish photographer and I had been for nearly 20 years photographing my hometown of Thigh County Kildare with a stark series of photographs and particularly a sequence on the wake. And I left a note in and uh, the next day I phoned up and the receptionist put me through to Mr. Becker's room. He thanked me for the note and said he'd love to see the photographs and particularly the sequence on the wake. So that was the beginning. And did he agree readily to be photographed by you? Um, first of all, amazingly enough, he invited me up to his room uh, in the Hyde Park Hotel. I was expecting him to come downstairs normally and just meet me in the foyer, do a few pictures, and then that would be the end of it. But no, he invited me up to his room. The pictures were thrown around the, this single room uh, at the back of the hotel, and he spent a lot of time looking at the photographs. And after about 20 minutes, when he was inquiring as to the names you were talking about, people, I, he was delighted that I knew who the characters were, Peter yeah. Boland, Mary Byrne, Mrs. Tyrrell, and uh, that was it. But, but also, of course, there were Beckettian characters. He saw more in those photographs than I did at that time. Yeah. Uh, when you did get to photograph him, this particular picture that we're looking at now in the cafe, I mean, we know his stage directions are absolutely meticulous. And when he's involved, when he was involved in the actual production of a play himself, he was very finicky about how he wanted everything done. Was he finicky with you as how, how he posed himself? Well, the first exposure I took of Mr. Beckett, actually, he's actually smiling, and I suppose you would say he's posing because he's holding his glasses down by his legs. But then if you read, the, again, the contacts, I'm directing him. I'm doing some, some uh, profile shots. I'm sitting on a bed. 
he, he, there's a television in the background, he's not looking at the TV, but then he knows that he is being orchestrated by me. So he starts, as you can see, he's beginning to scowl a bit here in this photograph here, you know, he's not sure what's going on. But we became actually, you know, good friends, and I would photograph production of, of his work in London and send him on the black and white photographs. Yeah. So, I mean, I think he was, he was quite happy. And he, of course, he invited me into the studio uh, in London to photograph and direct him. Mm. Uh, other people that you came across, I mean, he moved in a particular circle. He was acquainted with Francis Bacon, the artist, uh, again, a Dublin-born uh, artist whose work is now to be found mm. in the Municipal Gallery, whose studio is preserved there. Um, how did you get to know Bacon? Well, actually, Bacon wasn't a, wasn't a problem at all because I remember one day about 1970, um, I was on the editorial floor at Evening Stand. I think there was a story in the Daily Telegraph saying Irish painter on drugs charges. And, you know, I mean, certainly in the 70s, later on, it wasn't always too fashionable to be Irish. And I always wanted to get feel-good stories about Irish, be they musicians or painters. So I, I, I tracked down when Bacon was up at the Marlborough Street Magistrates Court uh, of course, he was acquitted on drugs charges because his then boyfriend, George Dyer, had planted a substance in his studio. And uh, so I saw Francis, introduced myself, and uh, after that I would see him in the Chelsea Arts Club, I would see him in, in Soho, obviously a lot of time in Soho, in Muriel's Club. And, and this places. is William Burroughs uh, with this him. Is William Burroughs, uh, this is William Burroughs, who knew Bacon, in fact, in Tangiers. And um, they became great buddies. And I did an exhibition years ago called Bacon, Beckett and Burroughs. And Burroughs was delighted to be associated with Samuel Beckett, actually. Mm. Um, sometimes, you know, you plan a, a, a shoot. Other times, it's completely serendipity. I mean, um, Yves Saint Laurent, where did you come across well, him? Well, uh, Ireland House in New Bond Street. I was down there one day uh, doing something. And um, I was walking back up the street. And I'd seen Yves Saint Laurent with two of his models. And again, you see, because I had access to magazines in the 60s, I knew exactly who Yves Saint Laurent was. You know, because this, the, what, this is one of his famous safari suits. His two models there are wearing the Yves Saint Laurent safari suit. So he's there at the first opening of the first Yves Saint Laurent shop in London. And of course, you can tell by the sequence. This is only one picture from a whole sequence. So he's quite happy to be photographed by me and with these two models. And but these, that was opportunistic. You just happened to have sure, the that's camera. Right. I, do you go yeah. everywhere with the camera? Um, I do have my camera with me. Uh, all the time, actually. There's a camera with me all the time because, again, I'm, I'm constantly looking, particularly with Beckett stuff. I'm looking for a Godot tree. I'm looking for things associated. Even in Dublin today, I was walking through the National, uh, Kildare Street by the National Library, and there's all these wonderful flags, uh, you know, introducing the Beckett centenary. So there's nice things to be, yeah. to be captured. We're going to, to uh, finish where you started in a thigh, and this, there's a, a group shot. Now, this is an extraordinary picture by any stretch of the imagination, if we can uh, pop it up. It's the uh, the, a shot of the entire, well, not quite the entire population of no, Athai. No. There we are. Oh. That's right. I think it was about 1986. Um, Agfa, who then were sponsoring me, um, we got as many people as we could on a particular Sunday morning, and uh, I was supposed to mention the word Agfa. I never I forgot. I've done it now, about 20 years too late, but never mind. But no, this is what happened. These are sort of some of the population of Athai in that photograph, and of course, many of the people there now, of course, have gone. But of course, in amongst them there, there's a, there's a very interesting Irishman called Vince Power who founded the Mean Fiddler. Yeah. And Vince came over from London to be in the photograph. So he's in there somewhere. Yeah. Um, what projects do you have in hand, John? I mean, do you have projects or is it all, uh, again, serendipity that you're well, no, now, chasing these now days? Now I have, uh, you know, my exhibitions at Beckett it's down in Leicester Gallery in Dublin. People can see real photography. And of course, I'm working in West Cork and I'm photographing food producers and other things. And, you know, people who make food down there in nice areas. So I'm doing things, constantly taking black and white photographs. Well, it's a pleasure meeting you. John Minnan, thank you very uh, thank much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.